Okay, well, thank you very much for coming today. Um, we are very glad to have you and we are very excited to have Jonathan Putnam here. Uh, he is coming to talk about his Lincoln and Speed book series um, about Abraham Lincoln's history. Uh, Jonathan graduated from Harvard College with a degree in history and was first in his class at Harvard Law School. He is a recognized Lincoln scholar and his award-winning Lincoln and Speed book series of historical mysteries focuses on the young Lincoln and his defining relationship with Joshua Speed. Jonathan has spoken on this topic around the country and was chosen to narrate an episode of the young Lincoln for the popular 10 American Presidents podcast series. Pulitzer Prize winning presidential scholar Doris Kearns Goodwin calls Jonathan's historical mystery series Splendid, one of the most enjoyable works of fiction I have read in a long time. It's very high praise. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Jonathan. I'll be hiding out in the background if you all have questions. Um, but again, we're going to try and hold those till the end. And Jonathan, I'll pass it over to you. That's great. Thanks very much for the introduction, Nicole. And right. um, thanks to everyone who's here. I'm really glad uh to uh, be joining you today so uh, i'm going to talk for about 35 minutes or so and then we'll have time for questions at the end uh and like nicole said if you want to put them into the either hold on to them till the end or put them into the q a or the chat um feature we'll do it that way i, I do have a powerpoint that i'm going to show during uh, a good part of the uh talk to um uh, illustrate it so you can see some of the people and places I'm talking about here. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now so that we can do that. So uh, in any event, uh, as Nicole said, I'm the author of the Lincoln and Speed Mystery Series. It's a series of um, four uh, historical novels. Here are the covers of them and the titles. Um, uh, so the books are historical fiction. So the books are my uh, narrative invention. The stories that, is, that are told in each of the books uh, is a, a, a fictional story, very often based directly on fact, but at the end of the day, it's a fictional story that I have put together to tell a mystery story. Uh, the book talk, what I wanna talk to you about today is history. So Whereas the books are my narrative invention, everything I want to talk to you about today, unless I tell you otherwise, is actual history. I never want people to be confused about what's real and what's not. Each of the books is a standalone mystery. I often get this question. So each of the books is a standalone mystery uh, and they can be read in any order. Uh, they are um, in the order uh, here on the screen though, the order of the books as they were um, published starting with uh, these on or dead, the first book in the series on the left there. Um, so uh, uh, a little about me, as Nicole said, I was a, um, a lawyer, I was a lawyer for 20 years for a big law firm in New York City. Um, I then decided what I wanted to do when I grew up was to be a, a novelist instead. So I resigned from the law partnership that I'd uh, worked my butt off to uh, achieve uh, and started writing the next day. And five years later, after writing and rewriting, I sold my first and published my first book. So I, I now have the four books out. Um, uh, I actually live in London, England now um, uh, with my wife and our youngest of three sons. Uh, and here in London, I am researching and writing my next book, which will be another historical fiction, um, hopefully coming to bookshelf near you uh, not too long into the future. So uh, what I want to talk today about is uh, the young Abraham Lincoln, mostly the young Abraham Lincoln, and uh, bits of his life and times, uh, especially his uh, real life best friend, this fellow named Joshua Speed. Now, if I were to ask you to form an image in your mind of Lincoln, it probably looks something like this. This is the old president, you know, shortly before he was assassinated, the end of his life. Um, he's only 56 years old, but he looks a lot older, I think, in this picture, uh, bearded, um, you know, lot, very heavily lined face, the cares of having uh, fought the Civil War and saved the Union, uh, very clearly etched on his face. So that's the image of Lincoln that I think most of us uh, carry around in our minds. And if you have an image of Lincoln um, in your mind that is bearded, and I think 
almost everyone always does because his beard is sort of part of his uh, iconography at this point. He only grew the beard during the election of 1860. So if you have an image of Lincoln as a bearded uh, figure in history, your image of him is necessarily of the last five years of his life. Those are obviously incredibly consequential years, both for himself and for the nation, but they were only five years of a much longer life. Um, the earliest uh, photograph that we have of Lincoln is this. This was taken in 1846, so almost two decades earlier than the end of his life photograph. He was 37, at age 37, he served for one term in Congress in Washington, and that was the occasion um, when his picture was taken here. Uh, and I think he looks, I mean, he's recognizably the same person, but he looks much younger, of course. Um, but, but I wanna take us back um, uh, to 1837, to the age of 28. You see on the left, he lived to 56. So I wanna take you back to exactly the middle of his life. He's 28 years old. Who is that person? So um, we can think about what did he look like visually. We don't know because there's no image of him surviving from that time. So if we want an image of him visually, we'd have to take this 1846 photograph and try to age it back nine years, make the, the figure in that picture nine years younger still. But really, who was he? What kind of person was he? What was his friends like? What was the place that he was living? What was his environment? Those were the questions that interested me as a historian. And those were the questions that I try to bring to light, bring to the fore in my book series. So uh, as I said at the outset, uh, a focus of my writing is this fellow, Joshua Speed. So let's talk about Speed a little. I'm gonna start here talking about who Speed was, and then I'm doing a little uh, comparing and contrasting of Speed's um, early life compared to Lincoln's early life. Now, as you'll hear, the two uh, figures end up meeting up uh, in their 20s and becoming very close friends. So that's where we're heading. But right now, I just want to talk about who are these two different people, these two different young men who end up forming this lifelong bond. Speed was a fellow named Joshua Speed. We do have a picture of him at the relevant time. So this is a picture of Speed in 1840, which, as you'll hear, is like exactly the time period that we care about. So this is what speed looks like. I'd say a you know, good looking, even maybe aristocratic looking fellow. Speed grew up in a, on a plantation called Farmington, which is in Louisville, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, the, the Speed family plantation still exists. This is a picture uh, that I took uh, when I visited it for my research for this book series. Um, and it's a historical site in spring in Farmington, sorry, in Louisville, Farmington is the name of the estate, it's a historical site. And so if you were a school child, for example, growing up in Louisville, you probably would have taken one or more trips to Farmington uh, as uh, you learned about the uh, antebellum period and civil war. Um, Speed grew up in it with a life of wealth and privilege and the wealth of the Speed family came from the forced labor of enslaved African-Americans. The Speed family owned about 60 enslaved persons. Uh, they were used to grow hemp, which is here being used for rope or packaging, and their forced labor made Speed and his siblings wealthy, made the whole family grow up in wealth, or allowed the whole family to grow up in wealth. Now, if we compare speed, where Speed was born to where Lincoln was born, it's obviously quite a contrast. Lincoln, too, is a son of Kentucky. We think of him, I think, as a with connection with Illinois. Uh, Illinois on the license plate says Land of Lincoln. And he did indeed spend most of his adult life in Illinois. But he was, he was born in Kentucky and born only about 50 miles away from Speed as the crow flies, although, of course, their material circumstances, as you can see from just comparing the two structures, um, could not have been more different. Uh, Lincoln was born in a one room dirt floor log cabin uh, in a place called Sinking Spring Farm in Kentucky. So these two uh, men come from very different material circumstances and material backgrounds. They also come from very different family backgrounds. Lincoln had, had a rough, uh, childhood. His father was this man on the left, Thomas Lincoln. 
Thomas Lincoln was a hard man and a hard drinking man. He was probably not literate. I'm sorry, he was probably not illiterate, but he was barely literate. And Abraham and Thomas had a very difficult, very strained relationship. Uh, the rule at the time was that uh, young men uh, owed their parents their labor as a legal matter until the age of 21. Women owed their parents their labor until the age of 18. Men owned their, uh, young men owned, owed their uh, family their labor until the age of 21. As a practical matter, many fathers um, released their sons from this legal obligation and let them go off into the world before 21, but Thomas did not. Thomas insisted that Abraham continue to live at home, continue to work for him. And in other words, go out and work in the community where all the proceeds of that work came back to Thomas. And he ins Thomas insisted that Abraham do that until the age of 21. As soon as Abraham turned 21, he left home and he never came back. He never looked back. Uh, this is skipping ahead a little bit in the chronology, but to give you a sense of uh, how uh, strained um, uh, Abraham's uh, uh, relationship with Thomas Lincoln was uh, it, uh, in the 18, uh, early 1850s, um, or maybe it was late 1840s, maybe later in life, uh, Abraham is trying a case, a legal case, because he's become a lawyer, and um, he gets an urgent message from his stepbrother that his father is on his deathbed. And even though Abraham is less than one day's ride by horse, from where his father is, he refuses to leave his ongoing case and his father shortly thereafter passes away without Abraham ever seeing him again. Abraham then refuses to pay for a gravestone for his father. So there is a lot of enmity between Abraham and his father. Uh, Lincoln's uh, mother is a woman named Nancy Hanks Lincoln. We don't have any images of her. She died in 1818 when uh, Abraham was nine years old. Uh, Thomas then remarries. He remarries a woman named Sarah Bush. She becomes Sarah Bush Lincoln. Sarah is definitely illiterate. She is not able to read and write, um, but she is uh, the uh, basically one uh, parental figure worth anything in Abraham's life. And he was very close to her. He called her uh, mother and was very, very close to her growing up. So uh, Lincoln comes from uh, unlettered parents. He has about one year of formal education in his life, and he is basically self-taught. Uh, Lincoln's uh, background in terms of his family can really, just as the um, two houses we saw, the birthplaces were so different, the families are very different. Speed grew up with an intact, very uh, uh, sophisticated, very well-educated family and very wealthy family. Speed's family, Speed's father was the fellow on the left, Judge John Speed. He was not a judge in the sense of being a formal judicial officer. We should think of him sort of as, although he went by the term Judge Speed, we should think of him as sort of a uh, town elder who people would go to if they had disputes that had to be resolved. Again, our Joshua, the one we're mostly concerned with here, say our Speed is Joshua Speed. Joshua's older brother, Joshua was the second of the Speed sons. Joshua's older brother was the fellow in the middle, James Speed. He became a lawyer. Uh, he was also close to Lincoln in his life. And James Speed became US Attorney General, so the highest uh, lawyer in the land from 1864 to 1866. Now, if you're good on your Lincoln dates, you'll know that Lincoln served as president from 1861 through 65 when he was assassinated. So James Speed was Attorney General at the end of Lincoln's presidency, he was attorney general when Lincoln was assassinated. And in fact, he, James Speed, Joshua's older brother, was the man who supervised the prosecution and trial and ultimately hanging of the Lincoln conspirators. The Speed family remains a very prominent family in Louisville, uh, one of the preeminent cultural institutions to this day in that uh, town is the, called the Speed Art Museum, which has this beautiful, very modern building that I have pictured here. The Speed Art Museum was founded by a nephew of James and Joshua. So one generation down, but the same, very same family. And it's a very prominent family to this day in Louisville. Uh, so uh, Joshua Speed 
uh, unlike Lincoln, who uh, had unlettered parents and had about a year of formal education, Joshua Speed had a full course of private education. He then went away to college, which was unusual at the time, either, even for um, uh, among, even among uh, privileged uh, white, young white men, it was unusual, but he was able to go to college. He went to college here, it's uh, St. Joseph's College in Bardstown, Kentucky. While um, uh, uh, Joshua was at college, he had a terrible lung disease. It was probably pneumonia, although it's always dangerous to try to map uh, 21st century diagnoses onto 19th century illnesses because they really had no idea what was going on in the 19th century in terms of medicine. Anyway, probably pneumonia. The Speed parents, uh, Judge Speed and his wife, were told that Joshua was going to die. Judge Speed uh, sent his carriage to Bardstown to bring Joshua back home to Farmington in Louisville so he could die in his own bedroom. Joshua lived. And having lived, he decided he wanted to do something different with his life. Uh, Judge Speed, his father, had declared that Joshua should uh, become a lawyer, should follow his older brother James's footsteps into becoming a lawyer. Joshua decided after he survived this near-death experience that he didn't want to become a, a lawyer. He wanted to become a merchant. And so when he recovered from his illness, uh, Joshua did not go back to college, but rather worked for a couple years uh, for a wholesaler uh, uh, in downtown Louisville, a uh, Pope wholesaler right on the Ohio River that cuts through Louisville. And then after um, a couple of years of doing that, in 1837, Joshua Speed did what so many young men and women, mostly young men, we'll get to young women doing this a little bit later in the talk, did at the time, which was to go west to seek his fortune. So in 1834, at the age of 20, Joshua Speed goes from uh, about 270 miles west from Louisville to Springfield, Illinois. Now, to sort of step back to the, uh, where are we in American history? This is the age of westward expansion. The Native American tribes have obviously occupied the inner part of America. Uh, I mean, obviously they occupied all of America in the original, but the original colonists settled the East Coast. America becomes a country and the white settlers of America start pushing further and further west. Um, the, uh, the sort of blue line that is here on the western extent of Illinois is, of course, the Mississippi River, and um, this marks the extent of the United States in 1834. So uh, this over here where St. Louis is, this is the state of Missouri, but up here, where, what's now Iowa, this is the Iowa Territory. And up here, this is the Wisconsin Territory. So those are not states, and, I, and this is the Michigan Territory up here. So this is basically the very edge of the state, uh, I'm sorry, not the edge of the state, the edge of the country that Speed moves to. Uh, what has happened uh, right before Speed moves is the uh, federal government has been prosecuting a series of wars, of skirmishes really, against the Native American tribe. It tribes in the mid 1830s, they fight a war against a tribe called the Black Hawk tribe. The tribe is routed and pushed west of the Mississippi. That allows the white settlers to rush in. It's a very fertile uh, area, very good for growing crops. And so a lot of white settlers rush into central Illinois and Joshua Speed is among them. Speed has a, a distant relative who uh, runs a general store in uh, Springfield and Speed takes over running the general store. This is the first picture of the um, street where the store is located. You can see it says Springfield Capitol Square. The Springfield State Capitol is gonna be built uh, immediately opposite the Speed store. Uh, and this shows you where the Speed store was. So let me stop sharing for just a second. I'll go back to that in a second. Speed is moved to Springfield, 1834, starts running the store. In 1837, April 1837, a tall stranger walks into Speed General Store. He's carrying in his hands two saddlebags and the tall stranger says he has all of his worldly possessions in those two saddlebags. The tall stranger says he has just moved to town, that he's becoming a, he's a brand new lawyer. In fact, just that very day, the very day that he meets Speed, he has just been sworn in by the judge as a brand new lawyer in Springfield. The tall stranger is new to town. 
He needs a place to sleep at night. He needs bedding. He asks me, can I buy bedding from you? Literally a mattress, sheets, a pillow, and a blanket. Speed runs a general store. He has bedding. Speed does the figures in his head and says, that'll be $19. The tall stranger's face falls. He says, I haven't got it. He says, if you credit me until Christmas, remember this is April, the tall stranger says, if you credit me until Christmas and I do well at my new job, I'll be able to pay you back. But if I fail in this job as I have failed in so many others in my life, I fear I'll never be able to pay you. Speed later says this is the worst application for credit he's ever received in his life. Speed says, well, wait a minute, why are you buying bedding? There's an extra room upstairs in my bedroom. Indeed, there's an extra room upstairs in my bed. Speed has been living, as so many shopkeepers down the frontier, above his store. In the narrow second floor bedroom above the Speed General Store is a narrow room with two double beds in which four young men sleep at night. Hurst and Herndon and two other fellows have been sharing one of the beds. Speed has been sharing his bed with another fellow. That fellow has recently left. So there is literally an extra berth in Speed's bed. So we need to understand at the time that the situation on the front here is the following. Land is cheap and plentiful. There is nothing but land now that the federal government has pushed the Native American tribes off of the land. You go down to the federal land office in downtown Springfield and buy as much land as you want for $2.50 an acre. Improvements on that land, houses, mattresses, are rare and expensive. And so it was very common for especially unmarried young men to share a bed at night. If you were traveling through the great prairies of, of Illinois uh, on one of these stagecoaches and you stopped at a stagecoach in overnight, you were very likely to share a bed with three or four complete strangers. And your only hope is that whatever bugs are crawling around in their hair are not fast enough to go across the mattress to you before morning time. In any event, Speed says to this tall stranger, why are you buying bedding? There's an extra berth upstairs in my bed. The tall stranger walks the stairs, looks around, comes back down and says, well, Speed, I am moved. Tall stranger, of course, is Abraham Lincoln, and that's the real, uh, real life, the true story of the meeting between Abraham Lincoln and Joshua Speed, these men who are to become such close friends. So if we go back to my PowerPoint now. Um, so uh, Lincoln and Speed live together for four years. Again, they're sharing a bed for these four years above Speed's general store. Lincoln, as my vignette suggests, goes into law practice. He goes into practice with a man named John Todd Stewart. And Lincoln's law office, you can also see on this picture, it's just one block past the Speed General Store. The two men live together for four years. They become very close friends. And then when they go their separate ways, they remain close friends. So Speed is uh, usually referred to in, with justification as Lincoln's lifelong best friend. So that's the actual uh, life and actual story of Lincoln and Speed. What I have done in my book series is to build on top of that, um, on top of that friendship, on top of that relationship, a series of historical mystery stories. So I've taken some of Lincoln's actual murder cases that he handled in his career. He ends up becoming a very prolific lawyer. He handled something like 5,000 legal cases in his legal career, starting that very day that he meets Speed and continuing all the way until 1860 when he's elected president. A number of his cases are murder cases. Most of them are not, but some of them are. And I've taken uh, some of Lincoln's murder cases, sometimes that change the facts around a little bit to make them murder mysteries and set the Lincoln and Speed the task of trying to solve the cases. So I sometimes refer to my book series as Holmes and Watson on the Frontier, just like we have. So um, where um, Lincoln is the Sherlock Holmes figure, the great man who is solving these mysteries that arise out of his legal cases, and Speed is the Watson figure. If you're familiar with the Sherlock Holmes books, the uh, best friend of the great man, the roommate, the spitting and sparring partner, and also the narrator, just as the Sherlock Holmes books are nominally told by Dr. Watson, uh, Sherlock Holmes' best friend, 
uh, Joshua Speed is my first person narrator. So my books are told by, you see the world of Lincoln through the eyes of Joshua Speed. So the idea of my books is that you are sitting on the shoulder of Lincoln's best friend as he has breakfast at the Globe Tavern in the morning. You're sitting on the shoulder of Lincoln's best friend as he sees the young Lincoln rise in the courtroom to argue for the life of his clients. You're sitting on the shoulder of Lincoln's best friend as the two men lie next to each other in bed tonight and talk about their days or their hopes and dreams, whatever you imagine, whatever we might imagine, two young men, two young single men on the frontier might talk about the 1830s. So that's the perspective that I'm trying to give you. So each of the books involves a standalone murder mystery and also a lot about the actual life and times of Lincoln and Speed. So uh, if you just enjoy the books as a, you know, hopefully entertaining, diverting murder mystery, fabulous. But I do have a, a somewhat more serious uh, project in mind. I told you that Lincoln was 56 years old when he died. Um, he was 28 years old when he met Speed. And it was, so it was almost exactly the middle of his life. Uh, he uh, was 28 years and two months old when he met Speed to be a little more precise. And Lincoln actually dies 28 years to the day after meeting Speed. So we're precisely in the middle of Lincoln's life. And yet the young man, the tall stranger who I described walking into Speed's general store is I think nothing like the image that you have in your mind of Lincoln. Not only did he not look like the 1865 Lincoln, his biography, who he was as a person was nothing like Lincoln. He was moving to a new town, in search of success, having failed at a number of jobs, carrying all of his worldly possessions in two saddlebags and unable to afford bedding, literally unable to afford a place to lay his head at night. So that was the Lincoln halfway through his life. How did that person become the most famous man or one of the most famous men in American history? And so uh, sometimes I think about my books and talk about them sort of as Holmes and Watson on the American frontier, uh, but the other way that I talk about my book sometimes, the sort of more serious or more substantive way, is with regard, with reference to the great Rudyard Kipling stories, if you're familiar with those, the just so stories. So there's stories like how did the elephant get the, its trunk or how did the leopard get its spots? Here the question that I'm taking on is how did the young Lincoln become our Lincoln? How did that young, unformed man who walks into Speed store in 1837, again, this isn't even what he looks like because this is him in 1846. How did that man become our Lincoln? How did that man become the Lincoln that I think most of us are familiar with? And so that's the more serious part of these books that through reading about Lincoln and Speed's adventures and the life and times of the frontier that they're living on, you get to start to see how uh, uh, the young Lincoln becomes what I'm calling our Lincoln. So there are a lot of different pieces of Lincoln's world that you get exposed to during the books. We definitely don't have time for all of them. I do want to talk about um, one piece, which is a remarkable young woman that you meet in the books, uh, a woman named Mary Todd. So Mary Todd or Mary Todd Lincoln is also someone who I think people uh, carry around with themselves, an image in their mind. The picture on the left is Mary Todd in the White House. If you saw the Steven Spielberg movie a few years ago, where Sally Field played Mary Todd Lincoln in the White House years, she looked a lot like that. And that's the way Mary Todd uh, looked at later in her life. She was a very controversial figure, but that's not, just as the young Lincoln was not the Lincoln we think of, the young Mary Todd was not the Mary Todd we think of. Um, so the picture on the right is a modern portrait, but painted to look like Mary Todd look like at the age of 21, hangs in the Mary Todd Lincoln house in Lexington, Kentucky, where she grew up. And I took the picture of the portrait when I went to the Mary Todd Lincoln house as part of my research for the book series. So uh, Mary Todd Lincoln is an extremely misunderstood figure, mis, uh, uh, misunderstood and uh, underestimated figure. And what I try to do, especially in a House Divided, which is the last book in the series, the most recent book in the series, which really focuses a lot on Lincoln and Speed and Mary Todd, is to try to tell the story of the real young Mary Todd Lincoln. And I want to spend just a couple minutes with you right now on it, but again, there's much more in the books. Um, 
So biograph a couple of biographical facts. She's born in Lexington, Kentucky. So she, like Lincoln and Speed, is a child of Kentucky. Her father is Robert Todd, Robert uh, Todd, who's a, a prominent businessman and politician in um, Lexington. Her mother is a woman named Eliza Pod, Todd Parker. Um, Mary Todd is the third of three daughters. Her mother has another daughter, and then her mother dies in childhood. So her father has five daughters from his first wife. Robert Todd promptly remarries, and his new wife has nine children. So Robert Todd has 14 children who he's responsible for. And Mary Todd has a stepmother who has nine of her own children to worry about and is not all that keen on worrying about the five children from her, of her predecessor, if you will, of her husband's first wife, now deceased. So I said earlier that a lot of young men went, to, uh, went west to seek their fortune and fewer young women went to seek their fortune out west. Um, the west was a dangerous, dirty, difficult place. It was very easy to die in the west. It was very hard to stay alive in the west. This, uh, this kind of atmosphere appealed a lot more to young men than to young women, or to be more precise, it appealed a lot more to young men than to the fathers of young women. And so as a practical matter at this time, it's the fathers of unmarried young women who are controlling uh, almost certainly uh, where they live. The result of this is that there was a huge imbalance of the genders in the West. So I've read accounts during my research of Grand Falls in Springfield where there are 500 men present and only 50 women present and half of those are married or engaged. So there's this huge imbalance between men and women on the West, in the West. There's one group of people who starts to realize about this imbalance and does something about it and that is the father of lots of daughters. If you're a father of lots of daughters at this time in America, your main job as a parent is to marry off your daughters. And uh, when you discover that there's this uh, new state capital out in this Western state of Illinois, where there are lots of young men and almost no young women, you may well think to yourself as Robert Todd thought to himself, huh, that's where I should send my daughters. So Robert Todd sends his first daughter, his eldest daughter, Elizabeth to Springfield. She marries very well. She marries the son of the founding governor of Illinois. Robert Todd then sends his second daughter to Illinois to live in the house of the first daughter. She also marries very well. She marries a local doctor in town. As soon as she marries and moves out of her sister's house, Robert Todd sends his third daughter to Springfield and her name is Mary. So the way that Mary Todd gets to Springfield, where of course she meets uh, Lincoln and the rest is history, is as the third successive Todd sister sent by their father to Springfield to find a husband. And then in fact, after Mary ends up marrying uh, Lincoln, Robert Todd sent a fourth daughter. So overall, four Todd sisters get sent one at a time from Lexington to Springfield to marry, to get married. So Mary Todd shows up in Springfield in 1839. Remember we said earlier, Link, Speed gets there in 1835, Lincoln gets there in 1837, and Lincoln and Speed live together until 1841. So Mary arrives exactly in the middle of Lincoln and Speed living together. Um, Mary Todd is a very remarkable young woman, the young Mary Todd. Uh, and I, I don't have, I don't wanna test your patience with too much information about her. Let me just, give you a couple of facts. One is that she was incredibly well-educated. She ended up having eight years of formal education. Remember, Lincoln only had one year of formal education. Mary had eight years of formal education. She attended this school in the middle, Shelbyville a Female Academy called Wards for four years in Springfield. She then, this may look a little bit, the picture may look a little bit like a man, but it's actually a very sophisticated French woman who had fled Paris during the French Revolution, ends up in Lexington as a tutor of young women. And Mary stood under her for four years as well, additional four years. So Mary had a total of eight years of formal education. This was incredibly rare for young women in America at this time. A historian has gone back and tried to figure this out. And they estimated that in all of America at the time, one tenth of 1%, a tenth of 1%, of all women 
had as much as four years of formal education. So only a few thousand women in all of America at the time had as many as four years of formal education. Mary had eight. So Mary was incredibly smart and incredibly well-educated, especially for the time. She was also, and this became important, incredibly political. I said that her father was a local politician. Mary herself joined the uh, Whig party. At the time, there was no Republican party. There were the Democrats and the Whigs. Lincoln and Speed were both Whigs. Mary's father, Robert Todd, was a Whig. Mary joined the Whig party when she was nine years old. She became an official member of the Whig party. Um, Andrew Jackson was the president at the time. In 1832, a man named Henry Clay, a senator from Kentucky, ran against Andrew Jackson for president. Clay was actually lived in Lexington, and so he was a neighbor of the Todd family. One day in 1832, in the middle of the election campaign, Clay's at home having dinner at his dinner table. There's a knock on the door. It's young Mary Todd at the door. She's 13 years old at the time. Mary Todd interrupts Henry Clay's, uh, Senator Clay's uh, dinner. She wants to tell him, she says she's come over to tell him that she is his supporter. She is supporting him in his run for president. This is 13 year old girl, Mary Todd in 1832. Never mind that she is eight years too young and 90 years too early to actually cast a vote for president. She nonetheless wants to make sure Senator Clay knows that she is his supporter. So that gives you a good sense, that story gives you a good sense of how um, forward she was, how self-confident she was, and how political she was. This is the young woman who moves to Springfield in 1837. When, I'm sorry, 1839. When the young Mary Todd gets to Springfield in 1839, she is a hit. Springfield is a very political town, and she is a very political young woman. And uh, it's, a, it's a very up and coming town, and she is a whip smart, very intelligent, very beautiful young woman. Everyone in Springfield wants to court her. Lincoln courts her. Of course, he ends up winning her hand in marriage. The real life speed courts her. So I've come across in my research letters where Mary talks about uh, speed and his uh, ever, ever changing heart that he may uh, offer, offer up to another altar. And there's another person who becomes historically significant who Mary is courted by, and that's the fellow on the far right, Stephen Douglas. Now, you may recognize Douglas's name from something that's called the Lincoln-Douglas debates. So much later, in 1858, uh, Lincoln and Douglas run against each other for uh, a position of senator from the state of Illinois. The two men go around the state conducting very serious, very substantive debates on policy. It's a standard of political discourse that I think it's fair to say our nation currently falls woefully short of. In any event, those are known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates, it's a very famous set of historical events in American political history. Um, Lincoln loses, Douglas is elected senator. Two years later in 1860, the two men have a rematch for president. Douglas is the main presidential candidate against Lincoln. And Lincoln, of course, wins the rematch and becomes president. Now, I was, uh, and you see Douglas in a number of the books because I was surprised to learn in my research that not only were Douglas and Lincoln political rivals in the 1850s and 1860s, they were exact contemporaries. They both moved to Springfield at about the same time in the mid 1830s. And they were political, legal rivals. They often appeared against each other in courtroom cases as they do in my book series. And they were also romantic rivals. Just as Lincoln and Speed courted the young Mary, Stephen Douglas, the young Stephen Douglas courted the young Mary. Indeed, uh, Stephen Douglas proposed marriage to Mary in 1839 or 1840. Mary turned him down. And Mary later told a friend that she turned down Stephen Douglas by saying, I shall yet be Madam President. In other words, the First Lady, I shall yet be Madam President unless I am a victim of false prophets, but it shall not be as Mrs. Douglas. So this is Mary Todd turning down the hand the proposal from this up and coming uh, politician named Stephen Douglas because she wants to become first lady. She thinks she's not gonna become first lady as Stephen Douglas's wife. 
She then marries Lincoln. 20 years after Mary has made this decision, the two men who have proposed marriage to her are the two candidates for president in the United States. And Mary turns out to have made the correct choice back in 1840, 41, by choosing to marry Lincoln. He becomes president. She, just as she prophesied, becomes Madam President, which is what the First Lady was called, in fact. So that gives you a sense of what a remarkable young woman Mary was. And uh, again, in the most recent book, A House Divided, we see a lot more of the young Mary and learn about her and, and what kind of person she was. So um, I, I'm obviously um, passionate about this subject. I have so much interesting history, really little known history about the young Lincoln. I don't want to test your patience any further. Those are some of the, just a little bit of a sampling of the life and times of the young Lincoln that I've delved into in my research and that I bring to the fore uh, and tell the story about in my book series. Uh, let me stop there. I'll stop sharing the screen uh, and I'm happy to take any questions that any of you might have at this time. Um, why don't you put the questions in the uh, Q&A box or chat figure, feature or Nicole, if you have any questions, feel free to get us started. <laughs> I don't as of yet, though, that's a lot more than I ever knew about Mary Todd Lincoln. So it's a fun little primer on her. Well, while we're waiting for questions, I'll say she is, she is roundly often um, viewed as one of the worst first ladies. There are some, there's a group of historians that survey uh, historians and political scientists about who are the best and who are the worst first ladies. And I mean, we can sort of stipulate that the position of first lady is a very challenging position in our country. Like you can ask, why do we care about who the first lady is? Why do we care about what kind of person they are? Obviously they're not elected, they're not paid. They've always been a woman, but we're about to have a female vice president. We're about to have a second man in uh, Kamala Harris's husband. And so hopefully one day soon we'll have a first gentleman or first man, whatever we'll call that person. Um, but so we have this sort of position of first lady that doesn't really make sense for that to be a prominent position, but it is. Martha Washington was a prominent figure. Very Todd Lincoln was a very prominent figure. You know, Michelle Obama and Melania Trump have been very prominent figures in American life. So it's a, it's a position that's always been prominent. They've asked historians, who's the worst first lady in history? And Mary Todd almost always shows up as the worst or one of the worst first ladies. And it's... Yeah, it's completely unfair. Again, it's a, it's a, it's just a, if you think about it, like, why do we care about this person or why should we be judging this person? That's a whole separate discussion. But assuming that we are judging this person, she was certainly one of the smartest first ladies. She was certainly, I mean, in terms of education for her time, she was probably the most educated first lady. I mean, obviously, like, for example, Michelle Obama was a Harvard Law School graduates, so they've been more educated, but in terms of education compared to their times, she right. was almost really the most educated first lady we ever had. And she's got this terrible reputation really for no good reason. And um, again, just as I think the young Lincoln is someone who's not the kind of person that we think he is, the young Mary Todd is really not the person who um, uh, we imagine uh, her to be. And so that's one of the things that I try to get into my book series. Good to know. Have we had any questions? If not, I can uh, close no, out. Yeah, no, anyone? Last call for questions? Quiet right. today. Let, let me go ahead and share my screen. I've just got a, a closing slide here. Um, so uh, as I said, I have, um, four books in the series. Uh, each one um, deals with a little bit different aspect of Lincoln's life or Lincoln and Speed's life. Uh, again, the last book, A House Divided, um, is Lincoln and Speed and Mary Todd. Um, uh, uh, thank you all very much for, for coming. I really enjoyed this opportunity to talk to you. Um, this is my email address. I always enjoy hearing from people. Uh, I've got a website with more information on the books in the series. Um, I have a newsletter that I sign up, that, I'm sorry, a newsletter that I send around just once or twice um, a year with information on the book series and upcoming projects. If you're interested in signing up, you can sign up online. Or you know what, if you just um, 
if you just if you just put your if you're interested in the newsletter, if you just put your email address in the chat, uh, I can just get it from there and sign you up. Um, and um, that's where I can be found on social media. Uh, I love to connect with and hear from readers. So um, as I said, this is really a passion for me. I really love this history. I love bringing it alive and bringing it to readers. And so I hope I hope this is an interesting talk. I hope you learned something new. And if you're interested in the books, please uh, 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 purchase one, read it, give it a read. I think you'll find it interesting. Thank you. All right, and thank you again, Jonathan, for joining us today. Thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we are very glad to have had you, and we hope you get a chance to read some of these books and enjoy them. Great. And thanks again. Thank Have a you wonderful day. Uh, oh, hold on a second. I've got one email in the chat to take care of. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Of take course. a picture. All right. Have a great day, everyone. I hope it, I hope the, I hear the weather's pretty bad. I hope the weather gets better there. It's it's improving. Right. Well, it's better than London. In London, it's been raining for about a month. So. Oh no! Well, thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye bye.